Welcome to everyone on this night before Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, we are going to continue where we left off. We have a smaller crowd, so <clears throat> more of a chance for questions, I guess. <clears throat> but we are in the middle of chapter 46 in part one, and it is on <clears throat> page 101 in the Pines, English. Um, and uh, if you remember, we had just described in the first part of this chapter, um, Raman was started to, after he went through all of the explanations of the different words and how to translate different words and so on and so forth, he um, started applying it more directly to, to how to read the Torah when the Torah describes God in an anthropomorphic way. And he told us that the reason why um, uh, uh, it, God is described in those terms is because that's how, you know, we as human beings, when, when something happens, when an action happens that, and God is behind that action happening, which is all everything that happens, of course, we experience it as if God did something. And the only way we can describe how God does things is by saying he used his arm, he used, he was angry, he used his, his, his eyes to see what we did and apprehend it, he used his his uh, feet to, 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 you know, and so on and so forth. So uh, it describes God with senses and it describes God with organs of action, even though obviously what, what, what he does is through his essence, not through any type of creation that he created, such as an arm or a leg or a nose or an eye, et cetera. So now he's going to continue on that discussion and he's going to talk, the, the, chap, the paragraph we're up to is what starts at the words in truth. So Ramam is going to explain uh, the function of the organs for a human being and, and then show how it obviously doesn't apply to God. So in truth, the status of all organs are the same. All organs, both the apparent and the hidden, meaning arms and legs and hearts and lungs, right, uh, that we see that we don't see, they are all required for various actions of the soul. They're necessary because the, the inner life that a person has, their soul, is, is our actual essence, Right. And all of the organs of the body that we have are necessary for the perpetuation and for the health of that soul. So, for example, some of them are organs required of necessity in order that the individual may last for a certain time. We need these things in order to live for the uh, 70, uh, 80, 90, 100, 120, whatever amount of years we have on this planet. We need these organs in order to sustain that soul. All of the hidden parts of the body are of this nature. We need our hearts to do heart things, lungs to do lung things, brain to do brain things, etc. And some are organs required of necessity in order that the species should last, things that we need for procreation. The organs of generation are of this nature, the sexual organs, obviously. But some, again, are organs required in order that the individual be in a good state and that his actions be perfected. The feet, the hands, and the eyes are of this nature, etc. All of them are required. We need eyes and feet and hands in order to properly walk from place to place to do our work to understand things, to see things, etc. And this says, <clears throat> I just turned the page to 102, the necessity of motion for living beings is due to its being required for the pursuit of what agrees with them and for the avoidance of what disagrees. <clears throat> we need to go places because we want need to go to the places where we need to go. Like we have to go to the grocery store and pick up food or go to the field and hunt or whatever society we're in. And we have to get away from the lion that's chasing us or get away from uh, the friend with the flu that's going to get us sick. So the necessity of the senses, on the other hand, like seeing, hearing, et cetera, lies in being required in order that what disagrees should be distinguished from what agrees with one. We can see things and we say, oh, that is a monster. That is a nice house that I can go into and close the door behind me. We see it, we distinguish what those things are, what we need to run away from and what we need to run to. Okay. Again, the need of man for manufacturing work. Why do we have to do stuff? is to prepare food and clothes and shelter, etc. This is bound up with the nature of man. I mean, his needing to prepare what is suitable for it. <clears throat> so not only do we have the ability to walk and talk and, and use our hands to do things, we also have the ability to create things that make our lives better. Sometimes it is found that certain animals have certain crafts because they have needs for that particular craft. Animals have the ability to dig a burrow, to uh, uh, build a nest or whatever it is that they need to do their functions. Fine. Now, I perceive no one who would doubt the fact that God may have exalted has no need of a thing that would prolong his existence or improve his circumstances. So by its very definition, 
God doesn't need stuff to accomplish the things that he needs to do because he has no needs, right? So it makes no sense. In other words, the Ramam is adding another argument to what he said before, which was that when we say God's arm, it doesn't mean he has an arm. It means he does something through his essence. But since we imagine these things, the only way we can imagine it is by imagining somebody doing something with an arm. We say it as if God did it with his arm. So God has no, has no need for anything and therefore has no need to do things to be in warm shelter or to find food to eat or whatever, or run away from a monster or whatever it is that he needs to do. Accordingly, he has no organs. I mean to say by this that he is not a body and his acts are performed through his essence and not through an organ. Now, faculties, right, um, undoubtedly pertain to the class of organs. These are the things that... Um, faculties meaning in this in this in, in this uh, context it means abilities and skills and knowledges right so god doesn't have any specific faculties thereby i mean what does i mean there does not exist in him anything other than his essence in virtue of which object he might act no or will so god's knowledge god's actions god's will in other words desire etc which is none of they're not separate entities in god and they're not things there's just one essence and everything that happens is because God makes it happen just through his essence alone. So for the attributes are merely faculties, the attributes when we say God is merciful, God is good, God, et cetera, those are really just with regard to the terminology. That's what we call things as we experience them, but they're not actual differences within God himself as, uh, because not, because, uh, and nothing else has been changed. There's nothing within God that's different. There isn't a mercy part of him and a good part of him and an angry part of him. It doesn't work that way. However, this is not the subject of this chapter. Fine. So now, so now Ramam is going to address another subject, and that is we all, any of us that have even been exposed to, in a small degree, to rabbinic literature, to the uh, Mishnah, to the Madrash, et cetera, we find it replete with tons and tons and tons of references to God in a physical manner. Why is God referred to? So Ramam has just finished explaining to us clearly uh, uh, that that the Torah and the prophets didn't mean to say, speak of God that way, and he gave a whole bunch of examples in what we studied last week. Now he's going to address Chazal. Why is it that the rabbis consistently describe God in such a way? And one could easily try to point to the words of the rabbis to disprove what Ramam just said and say, "No, what do you, look? There's so much it written in Chazal that describes God as, as in, in a way, and we'll see in a minute, basically as a king, and, and Raman will kind of summarize the way the sages consistently seem to describe him, <clears throat> and they don't seem to write that much, or at least that's what you might think, they don't seem to write that much about God not being actually, uh, uh, not having, act, and not actually having any human type attributes. So the sage, so Ramam insists that this is not that this is the case, and let's hear what he has to say. So the sages, may their memory be blessed, have made a comprehensive dictum, rejecting everything that is suggested to the estimative faculty by any of the corporeal attributive qualifications mentioned by the prophets. So Ramam is saying that uh, in English, in, in a more modern English, what he just says in that sentence was that they made it extremely clear and they stated it very clearly. And this is a strong statement because you can read through Chazal and not see this so clearly. But Ramam insists that they made a very clear statement, right? That anything that's described, that's attributed to God by the prophets in a corporeal way is not meant to be taken that way. This dictum, the one that I'm going to quote to you, <coughs> is going to sum it all up. It will indicate to you that the doctrine of corporeality of God didn't even occur for the single day to the same. <coughs> there wasn't a single sage that ever even thought for a second that God might have had some corporeal attributes. And again, this is, it sounds like an <clears throat> easy thing to say, but when one studies Chazal, it, it, it almost stretches the imagination because the descriptions are sometimes so, um, <clears throat> are so, um, are so vivid of describing God in a certain corporealistic uh, anthropomorphic way. But this, but I'm insisting, Ramam says, this was according to them, not even a matter lending itself to imagination or confusion. Don't even think for a second. Don't even be confused about it. It's clear. What is this dictum? Ram is about to get to it. For this reason, you will find in all of the Talmud and all of the Midrashim 
They keep to the external sense of the dicta of the prophets. They, they, <clears throat> in other words, they do continue to use those terms that the prophets used, which were anthropomorphic. They continue to use those terms describing God with an arm, with, with, <clears throat> with anger, with, with a nose, and so on. Why? Because of their, this is so because of their knowledge that this matter is safe from confusion. It's kind of like a, a, almost a, a backwards thing. They were, it was so obvious to them that it wasn't real that they weren't afraid to use the, these parables. Does that make sense? In other words, it was so clear to Chazal that God didn't have any anthropomorphic qualities, that it was so obvious and so clear and so far from confusion that they didn't bother even trying to explain it. And they used anthropomorphic terms because they knew that you would never be fooled for a minute into thinking that God really has an arm. So therefore, when they, when Chazal described God wearing tefillin or God wrapped in a talus or God, or God uh, sitting on a throne or any other description you find, <coughs> Chazal didn't have a problem using those explanations because they, they weren't afraid that anyone would even think for a second that it meant that it was actually real or true. Um, <coughs> And that with regard to it, no error is to be feared in any respect. You don't even have to be worried that someone's going to make such a mistake. All the dicta have to be considered as parables and it is a guidance conducting the mind toward one thing. The point of it all is to learn these lessons in order to guide <coughs> your mind towards the truth. And when the parable is of a consistent nature, as when God may be exalted, and listen to this, uh, is likened to a king. And this is one of the most common ways God is described. He's described as a king. I mean, when we read through the, the uh, you know most most glaringly you read through the um, liturgy of Rosh Hashanah the image of God as a king is so powerful and it's described over and over again but I, I want you to pay strong attention to the to the little hints the Ramam is about to drop in the next three lines here because a king is describing not just God's physical being so to speak as a king sitting on a throne sitting in a in a beautiful chamber or surrounded by his his uh his advisors and and his guards and whatever else he's surrounded by but also the way a king behaves is also an anthropomorphic description the description of God and this is a, who gives orders and prohibitions too and punishes and rewards the people of his country and who has servants and executives. Ramam is dropping a hint here and saying that I'm gonna to explain to you later through the course of this book that that's not the way God even relates to the world. It's a simplistic way for us to understand. God gives orders, tells us do this. If you don't do this, I punish you. If you do do this, I reward you. That's an extremely simplistic idea in and of itself, just as the idea of God sitting on a throne is a simplistic idea. But it's described to us in that way because they knew it was so obvious that no one's gonna make such a silly mistake and think that that's actually how God works. Think about what that means for the idea of Rambam's understanding of reward and punishment, of God's commands, et cetera. This is extremely important. And he drops a little hint over here, but we, we're gonna see it. We've seen this several times. And as we get through it, we're going to understand more and more how Ramam understands these things. So they, I mean the sages, the Chazal, likewise kept to this parable in every passage and spoke in conformity with what the parable requires. They mentioned that God speaks of speech, of a favorable answer being given, that God says yes. So when you have all of these very, very powerful images of, a, of, a, of one of the sages approaching God and asking for something, and God says yes. We mentioned someone asked about Choni Hamago, right, a previous week, where, where the Choni, uh, the story is he drew a circle around and demanded that God answers. Here's Rambam telling us that, and then God answered. Rambam is telling us right here that was a parable. It was a way of, of comprehending something much deeper. Did it really happen that God answers questions so simply like that? Absolutely not, according to Rambam, that's what he's saying over here. Or of a refusal with regard to a particular matter. How many times does it say so-and-so asked God for something and God said no? That's also overly simplistic. But Rambam is saying, and, and other such actions of kings, God was described this way as the king because because it's a way for us to try to get an understanding and understand what's happening. In all this, they felt themselves sure and safe in that there would be no confusion and difficulty with regard to this point. Chazal said it because they didn't even imagine that people could make such a mistake and think that God works in such a simplistic way. Think about this. 
It's really powerful. In other words, no, the Chazal couldn't even have imagined that anyone would make the mistake that a tzaddik could get up and demand God and then God answers just like the king would answer or that God would just meet out a punishment in a simplistic way because of something. It's so much deeper, so much more complicated. And Chazal figured we'd all be smart enough to get that and, and understand that these are all parables. And what is this dictum which states this? Where do I see in Chazal? Yes, go ahead. I see a uh, hand. Uh, yeah, it's Jeff. Uh, um, if it's so obvious, right. it doesn't seem curious that he's spending so much time uh, <laughs> trying to disabuse us of what is so obvious. That, that's a great, great question, and, and you're right. And and if it was so, and it's obviously not so obvious. That, that, that's a, it, and why Ram has been writing 49, 46 <laughs> chapters to get here and build up the, all this thing to get to this point, and he still has. We still have. Uh, you know, half of book one and book two and book three to go through till we fully understand it. And even then, right? But yeah, it's really not so obvious, but that's the irony of, of all of this. But here, here's what, the, but here's how the Raman puts it out. What is this dictum? <clears throat> Where in Chazal do they make this clear? And here's the, it's almost funny, but it's not funny, but I, maybe it is funny. I don't know. It's like, it's not in, uh, uh, you know, a, a famous Masechta that we all learn on Daf Bays and big black letters in the front of, of a tractate. It's a medrash in the back of Barashas Rabbah somewhere. Uh, but, but this is powerful. According to the Rambam, this is the basic medrash that tells you the key to all of what Chazal have to say. And what does it say? <coughs> it says, it reads, and I'm <coughs> reading from the English, great is the power of the prophets for they liken a form to its creator. <coughs> for it is said, and upon the likeness of the throne, was the likeness as the appearance of man. That is the famous verse in Ezekiel. I think this is the third time <coughs> Rambam mentions that <coughs> because there the, the, the Ezekiel describes seeing God as a man on a throne. It's the strongest anthropomorphic statement in all of Tanakh is where Ezekiel is literally in the antechamber of God, visualizing God and he describes God as a man on a throne, right? But, but what, how did Chazal explain it? as follows, Chazal explained it, and I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to see how Ramam explains this Medrash, and we'll understand why, <coughs> according to Ramam, this Medrash is the key, because the Medrash is saying, great is the power of the prophets, for they liken, a for the, the prophets are so great, because they do something that's so astounding, <coughs> so astoundingly astounding, that like, like, when we look at it, it's, how could a person do such a thing? How could Ezekiel Teach the world that God is a man on the throne and cause us to have and cause so many people to make such a terrible, terrible theological mistake and think of God as a king on a throne. Right. However, the prophets were so great that they were in, that they were able to describe God in an anthropomorphic way. Now, let, I, I kind of gave, gave away a little bit of how Ramam is going to explain it, but let's see that they have thus made clear and manifest, first of all. Let me make point A, Ramam says. They have made it very clear in this medrash that the forms, right, apprehended by all the prophets in the vision of prophecy are created forms of which God is the creator. The Chazal, and this is solid. Ramam is bringing a solid proof. I don't know how you could disprove this one if you wanted to. But it's clear that Bereshus Rabbah is telling us that when Ezekiel said that God was a man on its a throne was a form that was created by God. It wasn't God himself, right? That's clear, and that's absolutely solid proof from the Rama. So it's clear that Chazal understood, right, that when Ezekiel described seeing God as a man on the throne, he wasn't actually seeing God. He was seeing a vision that God created and, and showed to, to, um, to Ezekiel that he should see this vision, but God himself was separate, was something other than that vision. That's number one, solid. And this is correct for every imagined form is created because that's just the way it is, period. If, if anything that we see Anything that we apprehend is a created thing, okay? How admirable is their saying? And now let me go further. So what is it that they meant when he says great? So Ramam goes at a little diversion to tell us what it means when Chazal say something is great. And those of you that follow along in Daf Yomi <coughs> might remember Masechus Yuvamos, which we recently learned, <coughs> but he's going to quote from there in a minute. For as though to say they, peace be upon them, considered this matter great. What does it mean when they say great is the power? Because Chazal think this is so great. Why? For they speak in this way when they express their appreciation of the greatness of something said or done, but whose appearance is shocking. When you or I would look at it and say, how could you do such a thing? But for Chazal, it's, it's greatness to have the guts to do it, to have the guts to say something that none of us would have the guts to say. Thus, for example, <clears throat> 
a certain rabbi, there was a machloket in, 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 in uh, Yivamos, whether, <coughs> whether you're allowed to do chalitza. Chalitza says the action of, no, if, if, a pers- if a woman, if a man dies without a child, his wife is supposed to marry the brother. <coughs> and the Torah says that the action of chalitza nullifies that obligation and she can go free and marry whoever she wants. Now, there's an argument as to whether or not uh, um, you can use a slipper, whether, it ha- whether you need to have a bezd in there, whether it can be, has to be done in daytime. So it says, great, this rabbi was so great that he did a chalitza alone with a slipper and at night, right? Now, what does it mean it's so great? It's shocking. He's going against all of those other opinions that felt otherwise, right? But they called it great, <laughs> right? Another rabbi said there upon how great is his strength to have done it alone. What does it mean how great is his strength? It means how great is his power. They say, as it were, so, so in other words, <clears throat> something that you and I wouldn't have the guts to do, they were so clear about it they knew it so solid. They were so sure about it that it take, took greatness for them to do it. We say that often we say that it takes in Yiddish break the plates, you know, wide shoulders for it's very easy for a rabbi to say you're not allowed. Right. Right. If a guy comes and says, can I do this and this on Shabbos? Am I allowed to do this and this? It's very easy to say, oh, sir, you're not allowed. You know, but it's not so easy to say, you know what? You know, I think in this case, maybe maybe it's OK. You know, because that means you actually study the subject, you know the subject, and you understand the situation, and you're able to take upon yourself the responsibility and say, you know, you know, I, I'm not referring to someone who says you're allowed to because I don't care about the laws. I'm talking about someone who says you're allowed to because I know the laws and I understand how important they are. But in this situation, I take it upon myself that responsibility. And that's what this rabbi did with the slipper, right? I know all the laws, I know the rules, but in this situation, this is what needs to be done. And he therefore did it. That's great. And the same thing Ezekiel was able to say when he made that description of God and says, I understand that by saying this, I could be doing something that might mislead some people, but I still describing it this way, right? How great was the thing that the prophets were driven to do when they indicated the essence of God by the means of the created thing that is created, when they were describing God's greatness by describing his creations. Understand this thoroughly. They have thus made clear and manifest as far as they themselves are concerned, that they were innocent of the belief in the corporeality of God. So in case you have any concern about Chazal, go back to this Medrus and Beratius, and it proves clearly without any question that Chazal understood, even with the, uh, the most grand, the most mighty, the most incredible description of God in the entire Tanakh, they clearly stated that it's not an actual description of God, but a description of his creation. And furthermore, then, of course, all the shapes and figures that are seen in the vision of prophecy are created things. All other visions in the entire Tanakh are all created things, but not actually God himself. However, the prophets instead likened a form to its creator. They compared it. And why did they compare it? Rabbi already explained that to us in the first half of this chapter. They compared it to God because they said, they said, well, this is the way that this is a way that a human being can get a handle on how God acts, because that's how we experience things. But it's not how actually it happens. If, however, after these things have been said, someone out of malice. Now, I think the Rama means like this, you know, often you may talk to someone and someone who has a bone to pick with, uh, let's say Judaism, right? Or a bone to pick with religion in general. And he says, what kind of silliness is all of this? And, you, you know, Chazal talk about all the time, God having an arm, God having a leg, God having wearing tefillin, God wrapping in a talus, God uh, jumping over here, running over there. Like, what's all this business about? It's all foolish. It's all nonsense, Right. And you say, and then you start answering, no, I studied Maimonides and Maimonides says God doesn't have a form, doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a nothing. But the guy says, it's all a big joke. You're saying that because it sounds good, but you know what's written, right? Because all over there is written that God has an arm and a leg and a thing. And we bring him sacrifices so he can smell the wonderful smoke because it smells nice, the barbecue, all this stuff. So what so Rama was saying, if someone really wants to think that way out of malice, in the Hebrew translation, they actually use the language rishut, right? which means uh, out of evil, evilness, I don't know what the uh, better, better word for that is, depreciating men, people that are simply trying to make lowly, they're trying to make fun of Chazal and trying to make a joke out of the Torah, right, who are not seen and about whom there's no clear indication at present, his doing this will not harm them. In other words, Chazal knew and the prophet knew that by stating this, right, it's not going to do any harm. Uh, it's not going to do any harm to Chazal because because that's just them saying, making these statements out of malice. But Chazal, if you look at them honestly, it's clearly true that they understood the truth. And that is that God has no form, God has no shape and so on.
so this that completes chapter 46. Um, uh, I want to stop for a second and ask for questions, discussions. Uh, he's going to continue uh, on different angles of the same idea, but but uh, you know, uh, let's let's see if people have us anything to say, and then we'll try to do chapter 47 tonight as well. Any um any comments, questions? No. <laughs> All right. Well, drama was so solid that there's just nothing to ask. It's just <laughs> so obvious. All right. So um, so here we go. Um, let's do chapter uh, 47. <clears throat> Please bear in mind that everything we're studying here is building foundations. It's going to help us understand more and more and more of Ramam's philosophy as we go through this. And it's so, so it, sometimes it might seem like this particular issue isn't what bothers you, like the issue of the corporeality of God. But understanding how Ramam thinks and understanding how he describes these things is going to help you handle all kinds of issues that, that some, some might be more relevant to the doubts and perplexions that you or I or someone else might have. And, and, and if you, if you, as long as you, as the more we build upon this method, the more of a handle we have on how to think about these issues. And that's really the point of this book. So let's go on. We mentioned several times, chapter 47, I'm on page 104 in the Pines, that the books of the prophets do not figuratively ascribe to God <coughs> anything that the multitude imagines to be a deficiency or that one cannot represent oneself as belonging to may be exalted. So, so here's the thing. Uh, let, let me, um, even if these things have the same status as those that are figuratively ascribed to him. So, so <clears throat> what Rama is saying here is something that we've mentioned before. The Torah describes God in grand ways. It talks about his might and his power. It talks about his sight and his hearing that he can see us, he can hear us. It talks about, but they're all positive. They all give us this image of this great, mighty, wondrous thing. It never talks about God having pain. It never talks about God having anything that we would think of as being diminutive, as something of being a deficiency in him. Because the purpose of all of these parables is to create in us this image of something that's so grand and so big that we can't imagine it. It doesn't want it, even though Ramam just said in this sentence, if I'm translating it into modern English, right? Even he just said, though, that if you're going to describe God in an anthropomorphic way, it doesn't really make a difference if you're describing him as grand and big or tiny and small, if you're describing him as magnificent and wonderful or mean and, and tiny. Th th those are all descriptions that have no meaning with regard to God's essence. So if you're going to pick one, you could pick the other. But the Torah doesn't. It never chooses, Ramam says, to describe God in anything that we perceive on, as humans as a deficiency. It never describes weakness, etc. For the things that are predicated of him suggest the, to the estimated faculty certain perfections or can be imagined to be perfections with respect to him. Everything that we describe of God makes us, those of us that, that, that have, are, have an estimated faculty, like we estimate things. We look at things that are big versus things that are small. And we automatically imagine big things are grander, bigger, right? So, but accordingly, in view of this having been established, now let us understand why when it describes God with senses, which Ramam says, I just explained to you, God really doesn't have senses. He apprehends things beyond senses. It talks about hearing, sight, and smell often. There are many examples where we, and we've brought many of them, but it never talks about God tasting things or touching things or feeling things. It never describes God having a sense of taste or a sense of touch. Why is that? So, so here the Rambam says, and, and if any one of you can find a place in Tanakh, you can write a letter to, to Rambam and see if he answers it. Um, but uh, I, I, he's pretty solid. If he says it never says it, then it most likely never says it. So um, now the status of all five, anyone have a venture to guess before I read it? Why would it talk about God having sight, hearing, and smell, but not touch and taste? Let's see if anyone can take a snap at it. Taste is very, very limiting. Is what say that again? Very limiting. Like in what way? In a way that you, you, we even say that one thing can taste to one person great and the other person disgusting. So it, it would mean that God is so limited that he that he's like a like a human. I mean that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting thing. It's not what the Ramah is about to say, but I like it anyway. Because it kind of I don't know about touch, but I'm just saying in terms yeah. of in terms of taste. Uh, we, yeah. 
In Hebrew, the, the, the expression of different strokes is al tam al reach Mm-hmm. I, but right, right. So, so, uh, but, but it does describe God as smelling. We see smelling and re- representing God in many occasions, right? Especially the reach nichoach Hashem, right? That we find often. What if anyone else want to venture a guess as to what? Well, either what Rama might say or what, like Yosef just said, something that you want to say. <laughs> what makes those sense different? Um, Any other? Well, I'm trying uh, just to t- uh, taste. Sourness. I can't imagine God ever. Uh, I can see him having something sweet, but I can't imagine him ever having a sour taste. Sour taste. Well, what if what if he's tasting evil? Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's see how Ramam differentiates. And when you see the answer, what he says, it'll be so obvious. You'll wonder why he didn't think of it. That's what happened to me too. But um, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so here goes. Um, the status of all five senses. Is, uh, is one of the same. All the senses are a deficiency from the standpoint of apprehension, right? Um, uh, which is, what does this mean? This is so even with regard to a being that only apprehends by the means of the sense, because we apprehend things. <coughs> we can apprehend something intellectually, right? Which in Rambam's world is a pure apprehension, right? If you understand something, you all of a sudden understand the theory of relativity. You, you got it. It's not because of necessarily a sense. Like you may have seen the equations on the blackboard, right? You may have um, heard the noises of uh, an experiment, but ultimately the apprehension is the highest form. So the senses, that's what he meant in the first sentence. What we apprehend through senses is a level below that, right? We don't, you know, because we apprehend, I see a flower, you know, but, but, but I don't apprehend a flower. That's a much bigger a level. This is so even with regard to a being that only, but then you have other things for the latter are passive, receptive of impressions, intermittent, subject to pain as all, all the other organs, right? So, but, so if let's say an animal that doesn't necessarily understand things, but it sees something, that's a much lower level of apprehension. The meaning of our saying that he, meaning God, has sight means that it doesn't mean that he actually sees, but God apprehends visible things. He doesn't see anything because sight is irrelevant in reference to God. But whatever things that you and I see, God apprehends in the way God apprehends things, right? And the same thing is audible things. <clears throat> and it could have said the same thing about taste and touch. I'm kind of speeding through some of these sentences here, right? And that could have been interpreted as meaning that it apprehends things that if you and I taste a, a good piece of chocolate cake and it tastes good, God understands or apprehends the taste of a chocolate cake. Right, so it could have used that term. However, because the status of the apprehension is one and the same. Once you get to the intellectual apprehension, it doesn't matter what sense it was that brought you to that apprehension. If, however, the apprehension characteristic is denied him, if you say that God cannot apprehend a certain thing, right, then you would have to say that none of the senses apply to God. Like you wouldn't be able to choose one over the other. If, however, his having an apprehension characteristic of one of them, meaning um, an apprehension of what one of these senses apprehends should be affirmed. But if you say that God has sight, because it's not actually happening through an eyeball, through sight, it's actually happening through apprehension, it should apply to all. So that, that paragraph really laid out that in, in an in intellectual level, none of those senses are different one from the other. However, now that we, that kind of contradicts what the suggestion of Yosef that of the uh, taste being bad or good, because it just means that an apprehension, right? Ramam said, so there is no difference between the senses on the level of apprehension. However, we find the Lord saw, the Lord heard, the Lord smelled, but we never find the Lord tasted or touched. Okay, so I'm on page 105 now, right? Because... The reason for it is as follows, because if it is firmly established in everyone's imagination, God doesn't encounter bodies in the way we encounter bodies. When I encounter you or I encounter this table, right, that's not the same way that God encounters me or God encounters the table, right? So these senses, taste and touch, right, you cannot taste something until it's on your tongue, until it's touching your tongue. You cannot feel something until you're touching it, right? It has to be physically in contact. So however, sight, hearing, and smell, you can apprehend from a distance. You smell uh, an aroma from a distance. You see something from a distance, right? So therefore, according to the imagination of the multitude, in the common understanding of things, 
apprehension through sight and apprehension through hearing is this higher level, is this amazing power, this ability to see everything that's out there to be seen, the ability to hear every sound that's out there to be heard, the ability to smell every scent that's in the entire world at the same time. Those are, so. and remember the Torah has a bad pattern of only describing things towards God, which give us a grand vision of him, not things that seem limiting. If we were to say that God tasted and smelled, then we'd be limiting him. We'd be saying he can only taste things if uh, because that he can only apprehend things if he actually puts them on his tongue, or he can only uh, feel things if he actually touches them. And that would be limiting. And this is why the Torah doesn't use those as descriptions of God. Not because they wouldn't apply to him, actually, because they would, just like the other. Either, either the senses do apply or don't apply. If they do, it's because you understand it as apprehension. If they don't, it's because you say God doesn't have senses. Either one of those explanations are fine. But once, but if you're going to explain it in the way that the Torah does, then you have to only use the grand senses, the one that gives, gives us this image of God as, as the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the one who sees everything into the future and the past, sees everything that's happening, no matter how big and small, etc. <laughs> Which is why the sages have said, and I'm ending that, this paragraph, know what is above thee, a seeing eye and a hearing ear. <clears throat> when it wants to describe God's greatness, it says, no, da malam alam imchad, know what's above you, right? I in roa, <coughs> right? The oz and shomas, an eye that sees, because it's describing the grandness of God, the greatness of God, the power and the might of God, and so on. Now, when you investigate the true reality, the truth is, is that, is that um, like he said, he's kind of reiterating what he said before, um, <clears throat> that the status of all the senses is really the same, right? From the same standpoint, which is negated, because he has apprehensions, because God does apprehend touch and smell, touch and feel, just like he apprehends sight and sound, right? Uh, for all of them are apprehensions of a corporeal nature, affections and changeable states. These are us as, as corporeal beings. Something feels rough, something feels smooth, et cetera, et cetera. Something feels hot, something feels cold. However, with regard to some of them, it is apparent that they are deficiencies where others are deemed to be perfections. You know, okay, it's really reiterating the same things. <clears throat> I'm going to run through that a little. Therefore, fancy <coughs> um, that in the Hebrew word for this here and that word nine, I'm in the second factor, the Hebrew word is ayon, right? Usually we translate that as thought. Why exactly um, uh, uh, he chose, uh, I don't know why Pines chose it this way, but either way, the idea of ayon, which means imagination, <coughs> we don't describe ascribe it to God, but machshava and tvuna, <coughs> which mean reflection and understanding, we do. Because ra'ayon, even though, because imagination is somewhat derogatory, we'd say, oh, that's just in your imagination. You're imagining these things. What is it ra'ayon? What kind of crazy idea did you have? It's a, in, in Hebrew, you'll use that in modern Hebrew, right? A ra'ayon is just some crazy idea that plops into somebody's head. Like, what are you thinking about? So we're not going to use that term in reference to God because human beings perceive that as an imperfection, as a deficiency. Accordingly, the position with regard to the internal apprehensions is similar to that obtaining with regard to the external sense. So the same way we discussed that regarding God's inside thought process, so to speak, because of course there's no relevance of thought process by God, but just like we describe God's thought process, and I put that in quotes that way, we also describe God's physical senses in the same way, right? Uh, for they predicate of God what they deem to be a perfection in respect to him and do not predicate of him uh, that which is manifestly a deficiency. Again, the same point. Right. Uh, when, however, the true reality is investigated, right, that he has no essential attribute existing in true reality. None of these things are actually relevant to God. They're just simply ways that we describe him. And when we describe him, we choose the big, fancy, nice, grand sounding ones. And we don't uh, we don't choose the limiting, not so fancy, uh, not so nice sounding ones because we're trying to portray a huge, a grand, tremendous image of God. OK, so that concludes this chapter. <coughs> Um, and I, I'll open the floor for discussion. Any uh, thoughts about the senses? Any thoughts about why the last chapter about, about how Ramam says that the rabbis made extremely clear that they, they never even entertained for a second the, uh, the possibility of a, of, a, um, of, a, of a corporeal God. And also the point saying that, um, that, um, that God... Uh, the, the way that God was described in such a simplistic manner as a king who gives orders and punishes and, and rewards was also a simplistic understanding. I think that's, that's, that little key is, is a tremendous little key that Ramam dropped there. But go ahead, I'll open the floor, fire away.
if um if if everybody is just uh, has a lot to think about so um we can close it up and uh Mir Tashem, uh, next week we'll um continue with chapter 48 right um and uh it's going to continue on this idea of god's apprehensions and we'll it'll be, get it get a bit really interesting it's going to keep going so um uh if no one else has anything to say it's uh, been a wonderful uh time and looking forward to next week and um and uh, have a happy thanksgiving and uh take care and a good job and a nice uh, chodesh kislev coming up all right <laughs>